Hi everyone, I'm Jane and today I am here at Black Salt with my good friend Will XX. He's an awesome tattoo artist and a painter. And today we are both going to be painting this image using roughly the same materials. Yeah, pretty much. Mm. I think we went with the same palette, same paintbrush. Really palette. similar palettes and yeah, and our paintings are going to be so completely different from each other. So Will and I are both going to show you a little bit of what it is that we do in our painting, but we're also going to be kind of having some conversation about what it is to be an artist and, and kind of answer some of the questions that you guys give me all the time so that you can hear them from more than one art mouth. <laughs> So make sure that you check out the video description below. You can find links to Will's uh, website and social media links, as well as the list of materials that we each used for today's painting. And now let's get started. All right, so today Will and I are gonna be using my Frederick's canvas sheets. So this is the real canvas, like you've seen me use the white sheets before. The difference is that these ones are already toned so essentially it's an underpainting and the ones we're using today are 9 by 12 in the cappuccino color so i have my reference image here on my phone and will has his printed out but you can see how he's altered it here and you can get this image which i got off of pixabay but you can download it in the video description below for free as well so I'm just going to start sketching mine on here. What about you? Me too. Though. I don't think because this is a crystal, I don't feel like there's really any need to get crazy and like trace it or grid the image because crystals are, they're, they're all shaped so different. So growing up, I never really had proper art materials. Uh huh. So it was just office supplies and rulers. And nice. Whatever I can get my hands on, really, as a kid. And I learned to just kind of use whatever I had on hand. That's excellent. I love that. Because I get questions all the time, you know, about the materials that I'm using. And so I always tell people exactly what I'm using. And, you know, lately I use a lot of heavy body paints. But then I think a lot of people assume that. If I've used, you know, expensive heavy body paint, that they have to, or right. that their painting is not going to turn out good. Mm -hmm. And so I really like, you know, people to know things like that. That it's not the materials that you use. Oh, it's, of course not. It's what you do with them. Right. You give me some salt and pepper, and I'll make art with it. Yeah, exactly. I, I think it's the state of mind as an artist. In, in my world, in the tattooing industry, it's about that fancy machine. Yeah, yeah. One machine that's going to bust up your, your uh, skills. A lot of people understand that it's not what you're holding, it's what you can do with it. It's the experience that you have. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, once you get some experience and you know what you like and you know what you need as an artist, then, you know, you can make that decision to move into, you know, the fancy, expensive stuff. If you and know you're going to stick with it and it's something you want to do. Right. You can also ease into it. Um, yeah. In the beginning, I was using really simple, cheap paints mm -hmm. to do the background and to do the majority of the work. Mm -hmm. And I would come back with a nice, expensive paint at the very end for just little spots here and there yeah. to get that richness and that deepness. But there's ways to stretch it. It's not all about the cash. No. It helps. It's nice. But it's, you can't depend on that stuff. Yeah. Well, and it's, you know, like I always tell people, there's... I still use like basics for black and white and you know colors that I'm gonna use a lot of man I'm really having a hard time with this top bit here because I'm talking so much also um, using basic it, it actually it has its place oh because absolutely. it does have such a low pigment into mm -hmm. it I, I use it to basically water down other paints instead of water or anything so yeah just a subtle change in color Look at you, overachiever. <laughs> I don't know why I'm having such a hard time with this one little bit here. All right, we're just gonna go with it, however it looks after this, because I can make changes. 
later. I feel like it's not wide enough. Hang on, let me, let me finish this before you get going because I'm gonna have to do some editing here. Do you? Um, do you only sketch your drawings out by hand like this? Do you use any other methods to get your picture onto the... Um, I grid quite a bit. You're gridding right out? Mm-hmm. But, like I said, I didn't feel like this one was intensive enough oh, no. to That's why, yeah. need gridding. Superface. But, but yeah, so like my... We've done actually a lot of gridding this year. And I have people who really hate it and I have people who really like it and people it's, who did really hate it and now really like yeah, it. Yeah, it's one of those things you gotta grow into. Yeah. Do but you ever do gritting or? I do, I yeah, I have done gritting in the past. Mm -hmm. I've also done, used a projector to blast it in the forward method. Uh -huh. I've done um, where you, you turn your, you're drawing around and you just hit it with a charcoal. Oh and yeah. You turn it around and you just physically press a little bit harder mm -hmm. to kind of transfer it like a stencil. That's like a tattoo method. But the one I've really gotten to like is getting a high contrast black and white version of your painting, uh -huh. taping it to the back of the canvas and putting a lamp behind it. Oh really? Where you're projecting it. Uh huh. Because with a standard projector, your shadow is in the way. Sometimes the, the projector I have is kind of crappy too, so you get a little bit of a fuzz for details. So with this way, you get all the tiny details by just pressing back behind it. And then I can get a really nice high contrast, um, you know, burnt sienna version of it. And yeah. And I have all my details there that I need. Interesting. I'm really relaxed. So what colors are you using today? I'm going to start with my two basics right now. I like using... Um, burnt sienna mm -hmm. with turquoise. I feel that I get a lot of good values out of it. I like Utrecht. Their, mm -hmm. their uh, paints are actually pretty decent. It's a lot cheaper than like uh, Liquitex or Golden, but they are decent quality. And these are their heavy bodies? Yeah. I've never used those. They're nice. They're, they're kind of flowy. Yeah. And that's super expensive. Nice. You do the job. These are great for uh, transparency stuff. So I like a medium pigmented kind of a paint. Interesting. Because then I just layer. Yeah, well, and that's why I use matte medium yeah. to transparent it down. And so that's funny, our color palettes are pretty similar. So I'm using Burnt Sienna and Thalo Blue. And then because the image kind of has this vintage retro-y type feel to it, I didn't want to mix titanium white in there and get it to be too bright. So I'm going to use unbleached titanium today. And then I'll be using matte medium because... You know, I use matte medium. Yeah. Will has never used matte medium. So today, I'm gonna convert him. Um, so I would say for this painting, matte medium is probably not required. If you're you know, pretty confident in blending without it, you can probably get away without it. But I'm gonna use some. So to get started, I'm gonna use my half inch angle and I wet it in my, breath, in my jar, sorry, and then I'm just gonna kind of dab it on my paper towel. And so Will, what <laughs> he's using? Same thing. The same thing yeah, I like for the chisels. first time. Thanks, bro. Those are great chisels. So how do you prepare your brush to get started? I'll just give it a little bit of a wetness. That way uh, it, it, it uh... Unless I'm dry brushing, mm -hmm. I, I usually like it lightly moist. Okay. So do you get water way. as you go, or do you pretty much just like wet it once? It really depends, especially with uh, burnt sienna. Mm -hmm. The more the water you use, the thinner it gets, so you get light tones out of it. So yeah. some, I'll go back and forth. That way I get all my shadows and highlights already okay. in place with just the one tone. Nice. So I'm pretty much going to be using all three of these colors throughout the entire painting, you know, in various mixtures. Sometimes I'll have more blue, sometimes more of the burnt sienna. So I'm gonna concentrate when I'm working on like highlight areas, I'll have a little bit more of the burnt sienna. My shadow areas will be a little bit heavier on the blue. So that's just kind of a mix between both of them, about an even mix. I love my unbleached. So you go through and like block in all your shadows yeah. first? Yeah. I try to I start off kind of medium mm -hmm. and then darken it from there and just leave the highlights alone. That mm. way when I uh, layer, mm -hmm. when, I, when I add just the, uh, the tints, everything just comes through. So it just saves a lot of time too. I That's why I like using a lot of really watered down paints towards the end. To get those layers in yeah. there. 
Yeah, you can just get, like when everything's so black and white, you can get like a watered down purple and just keep going and then you get this awesome blend without the effort. It yeah. looks like you just airbrush the whole thing. And so is that kind of how you're thinking you're doing the purple? Yes, yes. Nice. It's just going to be a tint at the end. I'm excited to see that. I'm basically just going to do a really heavy valued one with mm -hmm. all these oranges and then put the black and purple at the end with white highlights. I'm pretty much just working on like a section at a time, like kind of taking each little pie wedge and working on that, except for the bright highlights. So I'll leave the brightest part for the end, but I'm just kind of going in and laying in the basic colors that I feel like I see to start. And then, you know, I like to work in a lot of layers sometimes. So I'm never afraid that the color that I put down is the wrong color, you know? Yeah. I feel completely confident to just go and play with the colors and see what happens and come back later and change it. There is this watercolor painter that I started watching mm -hmm. that he's got such an awesome attitude, really kicked back. And his big thing was as long as the sketch is accurate yeah. and your values, your values as you're good, your painting, then the color just doesn't matter. I'm not a good color mixing person and that really took so much stress off my head. I think people worry a lot about, you know, having the right color. Right. You know, I don't have that Absolutely. color that you have, what what can I do? You, Whatever floats your boat. Absolutely. Whatever. There's no right and wrong. There's no rules in art. Right. There are only guides, but what really matters is the end result. And if you're happy with yes. it. Perfection does not exist. I tell people that all the time. I hear that so constantly. People are like, well, it's not perfect, but... I'm like, My opinion on people who say that... Yeah is either they're looking for an excuse mm -hmm. to not do something full-hearted mm -hmm. or they really believe that and it's a mental block. I think from my experience, I think what it is, and let me just kind of take a break here real quick. Guys, what I'm, what I'm doing is, like I said, I'm not worrying about if my color is right or wrong. I'm just kind of looking at each individual piece and saying, oh, it's really dark right here. So I get a mixture of my colors until it's as dark as can be. And then it's lighter right here, so I pick up some white. It's, it, I'm not really planning this out a whole lot. I'm just going with my first impression. I'm gonna move over to this spot now. I haven't cleaned off my brush. It's gonna be, my brush is gonna be muddy and crazy. And I'm just gonna pick up some lighter color and I'm gonna start filling in this area. And if it's too light or too dark or too blue or whatever, then I'll fix it later. But I think in my experience, when people say, well, it's it's not perfect, but I did it. What I believe they're saying is, I'm gonna protect myself before you can tell me that yep. I did a bad job. You know what I mean? It's almost like, if I recognize before you do that my painting could be better, then you can't hurt me. Right. And. First of all, nobody should be saying horrible things to you about your painting. It's such a personal thing. It is. It's so personal. I know a lot of people don't like what I do, and I'm okay with that. Yeah. I'm happy with it. The yeah. people who receive my art is happy with it, and yeah. that's kind of the end of the subject for me. Yeah, and that's the perfect way to look at it. You know, unfortunately, I hear people all the time you know, who were like, well, I did this painting and I was really, really happy with it. But then someone told me, you know, that it wasn't good or that, you know, whatever. They just say something horrible. Mm -hmm. And then that person is just crushed. And that kind of stuff really makes me upset. Please don't listen to people if they say things like that to you. Do you remember what we were talking about with the stoic stuff? Uh-huh. Yeah, so so having so, value in people's opinions. Yeah. So you should you should tell people about so, that. So with in Stoic philosophy, Marcus Aurelius started up this concept of um, love and self-respect. The I can't remember specifically the quote mm -hmm. at the moment, but it was something along the line of um, 
why do we put value on other people's opinions when we don't care about them anyway? Right. And the way I like to see it is like if you go and get a haircut and you're happy with it, you're mm -hmm. the person that cut your hair is happy with it. Mm -hmm. Uh, you go share with your spouse or whoever, and they think you look really cute. Mm -hmm. And then you I like go it when out, you say cute. You know, <laughs> the ladies like to be cute, and they get it. Um, but then you get one negative opinion from somebody, and all of a sudden, that's all you can think about. Yeah. So if you understand that you love and you respect yourself, then your opinion has weight. Right. You love and respect your spouse and your teacher and other people who are in within this industry. Mm -hmm. They're opinions and their critiques should mean something to you right it's somebody that doesn't matter or it you know you don't like them or respect them then their opinion really doesn't mean anything to you unless you give it that right strength. yeah you chose to give that opinion strength yeah it's so true and after we talked about that you know that's something that i've been thinking a lot about because you know i'm on youtube man yeah. <laughs> YouTube yeah. can be an awesome place and YouTube can be a really horrible place. Uh, and, yeah. you know, so sometimes I, not very often, thankfully, but sometimes I get, you know, comments by people who feel like they have to spread negative things. And, you know, so that, that really was quite helpful. So I want to point something out here to you guys real quick because, you know, you know that I like to kind of practice my paintings a little bit before I do them for you. So I've done this painting, uh, I think twice, uh, really quickly. And one thing that I noticed, so if you're following along and you're painting it too, one thing I noticed with the way that I'm doing it, Will's doing it totally different, which is awesome. But as I'm going through and I'm filling in my crystal, it's looking really strange. And you might be really tempted to not go almost black in here. And you might be really tempted to not go almost white in here. But I promise you that once I lay in the background that is gonna be almost black, it's gonna be a chromatic black, it's gonna help pull these colors together and make it not look like weird colored wedges. It will actually help it make it look like this color is the background glowing through the crystal. So if you're at this point and you're like, this looks horrible, just keep going, don't sweat it. And I know that this format is a little different than what we usually do. It's a little bit more of a, a little bit more of a conversation and seeing how two artists can take the exact same image and practically the same materials, right, almost right. the exact same color palette. Same and, brushes, same everything. Yeah, and do it completely different. So, you know, I hope that that helps give you the confidence to really just take whatever it is you have and do whatever technique you feel like is going to give you the look that you want. So I feel that I've definitely crossed a learning curb. Oh, I don't yeah? Know if you ever feel, have that feeling where one day you're just kind of casually painting and you're like, oh, man, I really know what I'm doing. Yep. Like, for some reason, my hands are really listening to me. Yep. I find that feeling so comforting. And it's honestly, it's taken me about 15 years worth of painting to feel this way. See, that's another thing that I always tell you guys because, you know... People sometimes, you know, I get asked things like, well, do you have any tips on how to do this? I have a really hard time doing this or this. How can I... Do it more often. Exactly. <laughs> practice. There's no shortcut to practice. And, you know, everybody kind of grows and learns at a different pace, depending on a lot of factors. Like, I'm just going to grab a little bit more of my white here because I have a really solid color going on in here. So I'm just going to kind of tap it and just break it up in there. And then we start getting kind of that smoky crystal look. But there's no shortcut to practice. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everybody learns at a different rate, but also everybody, you know, has different amounts of time that they can dedicate to it, you know. But it really depends on your dedication to what you want to do. I also think rushing 
rushing yourself and pressuring yourself to be great yep. right out after day one yep. will screw with your confidence. Absolutely. Like give it a little time. Yeah, and you don't have to. Compare your work ever to anybody else's. Comparison is so you know, toxic. If you want to give yourself a little bit of a pat on the back, look at what you did six months ago. Put it side by side and go, yeah, you know, I, I am growing. It's hard to see on a daily basis, but just keep your old work. Don't throw anything away. Yeah. Well, I did just throw some stuff away. <laughs> <laughs> We're cleaning out a storage unit, and oh my gosh, we have some, we have so much stuff, and I found some old canvas boards, and I'm like, nobody even needs to see these, so bye bye they went. You don't, you don't jessel them up and recycle? Man. Renew, reuse? Do you know how many canvases I go through in a week? <laughs> I have stacks and stacks and stacks of what I call junk canvases that I paint over. I don't need any more. Build one ultimate canvas, <laughs> like a mech canvas. <laughs> like a what? A mech canvas. What does that mean? It's like when a robot is made by other robots to make a, oh. a super robot. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I guess I could probably do that. I have a hard time throwing things away sometimes. Yeah, me too. Because I feel like everything has some type of use. Yeah, especially art supplies. Like that, that one last little squirt of paint in the bottom of the tube. Like, I bet I could cover a whole canvas with that. But is it going to take me 45 minutes to get it out of there? I got a paint squeezer. Have you seen those? Yeah, I got one too. They're pretty neat. But every once in a while I still think, I bet I could get more out. <laughs> so... Yeah, I'm just kind of playing with the, the tones. So if you can tell... Some areas I've got are very blue, some are a little bit more brown, but again, all brush loads are those same three colors mixed together. And what are you doing? So you got your, those are your dark areas that you're blocking in there? Yeah, these are the dark ones, and what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna mute, uh, mute my burnt sienna with a little bit of turquoise. Oh, show that on the camera. Oh. Yeah. So basically, burnt sienna is kind of an like orange and Turquoise is a blue, mm -hmm. so if you want to just break it down to primaries, orange and blue, they're opposite, they're complementary. Mm -hmm. You mix them both, you're going to get a nice gray. Mm -hmm. So if you slowly introduce one to another, you're going to dull that color down. So now, right now I'm dulling my burnt sienna with a little bit of turquoise. It's going to get slightly green, but it's going to give me a darker value without jumping into black. Yeah, so that's so funny because we really are doing like practically the exact same thing. We didn't talk about what we were doing beforehand. Well, I guess I did tell you last night what my color palette was, but you already had yours planned out, so I figured that I was safe to do so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those colors really do kind of have like a gel look to them. That's yeah. really interesting. I've noticed that with paintbrushes, you get like a little bit of a smoother blend. Mm -hmm. And um, this is why I have my palette knife, because uh. I always finish paintings off with really chunky Yeah, rods. I've seen that in your work, and I've wondered how you did that. I didn't realize that you were going through afterwards with a palette yeah. knife. I, 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 Hyperrealism is nice, mm -hmm. but I like when my painting looks like a painting. Yes. I want to see brush strokes. I want to see imperfections. I don't want it to look like I just took a picture or something. Yes. So just last week, the painting that we did last week, The Lotus, uh, I was talking to somebody while we were uh, doing the premiere and they said something about, you know, not liking brush strokes because I had mentioned it was okay to let brush strokes Love be them. in there. Yeah, man, like They're I said expressive. there, you made the painting with a paintbrush. Make it, it might as well look like you mm -hmm. made it with a paintbrush. Also, you can you can express emotion like yeah. freaking anger or yeah. just something. There's just something beautiful about seeing raw paint brushes. Exactly. Yeah, I'm really glad that you brought that up. See guys, I tell you these things all the time. I'm not making it up. <laughs> you guys have actually heard me talk about Will several times. So you know how I'm always harping on you to like stand back and hold your paintbrush far at the end and loosen up. So Will was actually the first one to say that to me. And I admit that back then I was like, you're dumb. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell me what to do. And, but now that, you know, I gave in and I do it, 
I mean, a lot of these guys think that I'm dumb and probably tell me not to tell them what to do when I tell them to loosen well, up. But. I think we're all kind of that way. We get good advice and then yeah. until you have that voila moment of your own, yeah. you're, you're just going to kind of yep. not really go by it. Do you know what a, I don't even know what it's called. So I, I've read for a long time that Salvador Dali mm-hmm. used to get his cane as he was sitting and he would put it in his shoe uh-huh. and put his forearm on it, on the cane itself to, oh, to yeah. steady himself up. Yeah. I've known this for a very long time. Mm-hmm. I think it was maybe last year. I had a stick. I, had, I got a stick specifically for this. It sat there for a long time. No and then way. one day I just grabbed it within a couple minutes like, what? <laughs> what? What, why I could have been like, doing this yeah. for years. This is so much easier. Yeah. So Gets it's kind of like almost like using a mall, uh, mall stick. That's what but, it is. But he rested it on the ground yeah. instead of on the edge of the canvas. So some things just take a little time to settle in your brain. And the underpainting, so a lot of people don't understand underpainting or, you know, I tend to do, I really like, like crazy underpaintings, Mm -hmm. but um, you were the one that actually made me aware of underpainting, so a lot of Will's art, why don't you explain your art, how would you describe your paintings that you tend to do? I don't I don't know. I just kind of go for whatever's in my head. There's there's specific artists that I admire mm-hmm. and I, I try to mimic their techniques. Mm-hmm. And then that's how I kind of develop my own, but it's really just a bunch of pictures in my head that I'm just trying to express on canvas. But would you say it's darker? Like dark art or Yeah, a little bit abstract, a little yeah. bit dark subject matter. Uh not exclusively, but, a, no, but I, often. I, I also like psychology and putting in a couple of little cutesy things yeah. or pastel colors. I did this one series with just hospital colors, or I did this one in just nursery colors, but it was dark subjects. Yeah. So it's screwing with your emotions a little bit. You're seeing these soft pastel pinks with like, you know, a little decapitated doll or something. <laughs> Well, and that's my point is a lot of times, you know, he's got these darker subject matters and he'll have his underpainting will be like mint green or, you know, fuchsia. And that's a really cool, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't know. Right now, um, the underpaintings that I do, Mm -hmm. I'm kind of using more to um, help me establish temperature because I know if that's why I lay down all this orange and then put blue on top of it because mm-hmm. it's going to get that it's going to neutralize itself and make it into a richer black you're going to get more depth out of it instead of throwing straight black on top of that right it's easier and faster but there's just something about having a rich layered canvas where the colors play on the canvas itself and you're looking at everything like through lenses yeah, because even if you don't look at it and see it in the end, if you're like, well, why did I bother putting that hot pink on there? I don't it, see there, it. It does make a difference. It does make a difference. Try doing half and half. Exactly. Do like a blue uh, underpainting, do mm-hmm. an orange underpainting, and do the same thing and all, and you'll see what the temperature difference yep. is. We did that a while ago. I did a little, uh, just like a quick impressionist landscape, and... The one I did in the video, I used cad red medium. So, you know, that's a pretty fiery, intense color. And I used that for my underpainting. Speaking of underpainting, I believe, I think I'm done with my first layer on my entire crystal. So I did the cad red medium for the underpainting for this landscape. And then to show how it made everything different, I did a couple different ones. I did one with uh, cad yellow, one with... I think it was cobalt, no, it was ultramarine blue, and one with quinacridone, you know, and all of them, even though I used the same colors on the actual painting itself, each one of them kind of lent something different to the painting. Like, I felt like the blue one made the landscape look very cold, made much colder than the, you know, like the one with the the quinacridone, which made it quite bright and, and pop. 
I'm gonna go down to my quarter inch and I'm gonna start working on the details. Maybe I'll zoom me in here just a little bit. Yeah, that color is so rich and deep, that black you have there. Yeah, and it's just mixing two uh, complementary colors. Yeah. So I picked up a little matte medium, mostly just unbleached titanium. There's a little mix of those other two colors there. And I'm just gonna start kind of making changes to the colors as I feel like I need. So like this one, obviously, in my image is very, very bright. That's kind of the focal point, I feel like, of the crystals right there. So I'm going to start working on kind of brightening that. So don't feel like you have to go, you know, straight to the final color or the final brightness or anything right off the bat. And relax. Just, yeah. just paint. Have a good time. There's no right and wrong. Quit pressuring yourself to do this perfect, you know, single shot painting that you think is going to define you as an artist. Yeah. Just chill. It's just paint. So, how did you get into art? What what got you started? Um. Well, <laughs> there was um. A kid in my neighborhood who was the oldest he was in junior high at the time I think it was like seven or eight and I thought he was really cool mm -hmm. he liked to draw he was a gangbanger mm -hmm. and the type of drawing he was doing a lot of like graffiti stuff on the walls and he ended up like I would join the gang when I was about 11 but honestly that weird beginning is what got me involved in art I just wanted to be cool like him and uh, Immediately, I just found that I had a really good time doing it, and I was decent at it. Yeah. But what ended up really kicking me in the butt later in life was the arrogance that came, comes along with having natural talent. You think you know everything. I was a terrible student in high school. <laughs> I really, I barely passed art. I think I would always pass with a C just because I wouldn't do any of the, the projects I was told because I thought I was above it. So I never really paid attention to anybody that taught me art until I went to college in my 30s. Yeah. And that's when I realized that I still have a long way to go. Right. And you did that just because you wanted to. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I felt stagnant. I felt like I wasn't growing and I needed proper education. Right. And uh, what got you into tattooing? I was in the military, and I was one of these people that thought they could do everything, so I started, <laughs> again, with the arrogance. I started, You're such an arrogant I, dude, I, Will. I'm thrilled. <laughs> and uh, I just started ordering crappy equipment off eBay, uh -huh. doing everything the wrong way. Oh, no. And then from there, I just started tattooing people in the barracks. I didn't really know what I was doing, but I'd been getting tattooed since I was 14. So I was a lot of monkey see, monkey do. And... Uh, when I got out, I couldn't find a job. I couldn't, I was, I worked on helicopters in the military. Mm -hmm. and that's what I was supposed to do and I couldn't find a job. So eventually after three months, I walked into this tattoo shop that was built while I was in Iraq. Mm -hmm. And I showed them my crappy MySpace pictures <laughs> of these tattoos I'd been doing over the years. And I got an apprenticeship on the spot. And that's no when I, way. And I figured I needed to do something to feed my family and sitting around hoping for a helicopter job wasn't doing it. So I just threw everything away right. and took a gamble and started tattooing. Good for you. And now? Now I'm into it. It's year 13. Man. And oh, kind of, lucky 13. Yeah, something like that. So you said something a minute ago that I want to talk about. You said, you know, um, having something about people with natural talent. Oh, yeah. So I want to talk about that for a minute because I think that there's a lot of people 
um, who, you know, because I hear all the time, well, I don't have any, I'm not talented. Talent's overrated. Talent is overrated, but tell these guys that, because I tell them that all the time. So, when I was in college, it was explained to me like this, and it was it made so much sense, and it was it was beautiful. Mm -hmm. If you, if your father was a plumber, for example, mm -hmm. and he was a, a, a very good professional plumber, been doing it for years, has the best tools. Mm -hmm. Say he passes away, uh, you inherit these tools, top of the line. That's natural talent. You still have no idea how to use them. Yeah. All you have Perfect. is a little advantage over the next guy who doesn't have these tools. You still got to go to school, get fundamentals, understand the entirety, and then... And practice. And practice, practice, practice. All you have is these really nice tools. Yeah. It doesn't make you great. Yeah. And so, it doesn't mean you know how to use them. Or... Right. You don't, you don't have any idea. You got to put that ego stuff aside. Excellent. And just do the work. But... So, can any Joe Schmo who's never even seen a plumber before go buy plumber tools and become an excellent plumber? <laughs> no, it, it, you know, it's something you build up to. You, yeah. You, you get the simple basic tools. You yeah. get you, whatever you can work with and you just... I started... All I did was pen and paper because mm -hmm. that's all I had on hand. You don't have to go get the professional stuff right off the bat. Right. Just work with what you have. Art is a state of mind. Um, art is a verb. Yeah. Not the materials you use. It's this could be done honestly. We could do this with coffee, yeah. with mud, with yeah. you know, I've seen people paint with blood. Yeah. It's not the materials, it's not the tools you have, it's the skills you can have edu with educated hands and the, the imagination that you and have. And the intention that you put into it. So I think tools are nice, really nice tools are great. Yeah. They make things easier, mm -hmm. but it's not necessary. Yeah. I think People will spend a bunch of money on these tools and get so discouraged because they expected them to just be like the know-all. Once they we use these one specific paint, everything's going to come out so beautiful and easy. Right. That's, you still need to practice. Yep. It's true. Yeah. And, you know, I started out with craft paint and I know a lot of people who are probably watching this right now use craft paint. It's hard and to use craft paint. It is hard to use craft paint. But if that's all you can afford and you have the drive to make art, then you use that craft paint and you enjoy every minute of it. And then someday when you can afford, you know, to upgrade from your craft paint, you do. But you don't hold off on making art until that day comes because in the meantime, you're just going to waste a bunch of time and, you know... What I think is cool about that craft paint is that it's so difficult to use mm -hmm. that when you do start using quality paints, yeah. you're like, oh my God, I got yeah. this. Yeah, you're, whoa, one coat covered that. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, you know, it's like Rocky, you know, using a log in the snow. <laughs> you know, just whatever you have to train, just train, 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 yeah. practice, practice, practice. It doesn't matter. Get a number two pencil. It doesn't matter. Absolutely. Get a piece of charcoal off the grill. It doesn't yep. matter. <laughs> Stop pressuring yourself. Yeah. This is supposed to be fun. Exactly. Even though I do art for a living, I insist that it's fun. If it's not fun, I don't want to do it. No way. I'm a I'm a grown spoiled child. <laughs>
And so if I don't cover the canvas all the way, it doesn't matter at all. It completely blends in with these colors, which is great. It's also nice because when you do use white, it'll make it special. Yeah. It won't just blend into the canvas. And then you'll exactly. lose the power of that white. You gotta keep your values strong. Yeah, I'm, I really love these colors together. I don't think, I usually mix thalo blue with burnt umber, not burnt sienna. And I felt like I wanted a little bit more warmth in this image than burnt, than burnt umber would give. So I decided to try the burnt sienna and I feel like I might like this color mixture better than better than burnt umber. There's um when I was looking at trying to understand blacks, mm -hmm. different kinds of blacks, like yeah. I I just kind of googled it and I found this great page and it explained the tones and the origins of each black. Uh -huh. And then it said that uh if you got ultra are you using over there? This is thalo blue, but yeah, Ultra ultramarine. Marine French blue. Uh huh. Oh, that and um, burnt sienna. Yep. Basically, you can make a warm black, you can go mm -hmm. a cold black, you can really control that. Yep. Depending on which one you use more. That I do that one a lot. That um, is a really good replacement for Payne's Gray, too. And so I use Payne's Gray quite a bit, but sometimes I want to be able to say, you know, now the Payne's Gray is warmer, or now it's cooler, so I'll use. Um, I actually typically use the Burnt Umber rather than Burnt Sienna, but yeah, they both, they both do it with the Ultramarine. Yeah, I did a video a while ago, uh, about a year and a half ago now, 10 different ways you can make chromatic black. Nice. So that was a lot of fun. And for the most part, while I was making that video, there were a couple that I, you know, that I was going specifically for, but for the most part in that video, I just kind of grabbed random colors and said, oh, I don't know, let's see if this makes black. Oh, look, it does. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it should show you that you can get so creative and I next to never use black paint anymore. I have right. this big tub of it at home, and I'm like, what am I going to do with all this black paint? I am going to use some today, um, but mostly I use it when it doesn't matter. <laughs> so right now, oh, man, I'm going to so good. I'm going to reshape my gem. Uh huh. And uh, I noticed that my sketch was off in the beginning, mm -hmm. but I wanted to do that on purpose because sometimes people feel like they've reached a point like, oh, it sucks, and they just want to ruin yep. everything. It's um, it's like a sculpture. You just got to keep give and take, that give and take, give and take. That is a perfect way to look at it because I'm always telling people, you know, don't worry about it. You can you can change it in the next layer, you Re know, but yeah, sculpting, that's so perfect. right here it's a little too blunt. I wanna make it a little bit sharper. Mm -hmm. So I'm just gonna edit the edges. And see, that's, that's another reason, guys, that it's really nice to paint the background last. You know, whenever I paint the background last, you guys always ask, well, can I paint the background first and then just paint the, you know, the subject on top of it? I mean, you can, but you lose the opportunity to make adjustments like that. Like, you know, if, if he had painted the entire background and got that completely done and then decided after he did the crystal in the background and everything that the crystal was off and needed to be adjusted, he would have to completely repaint the background that he just painted and you know, things would start looking different because it had been finished and then repainted. But, you know, like I'm doing my background last because I'll be able to adjust my crystal if I need to or, yeah, it's, it's a valuable tool to use, but I know some people are resistant because it seems more difficult. How often do you think you paint the background last? You know, Sometimes I'll block it off the way I do here, uh -huh. and uh, it it helps me see the highlights and the values in my vein, in my, especially if I know I'm going to go dark in the background. Yeah. But then I've done I've done it. I've lightened the background in the middle of the painting. I've gone to redarken the background. Yeah. It's just however I feel. I don't try to limit myself to okay. This these are the steps I'm going to take one two three. Right. 
So it's whatever gets me there. Sometimes it's a little different. Other times it's really smooth. Yeah. Other times it takes a little longer to get there, but I'm not worried about that. I try to enjoy the journey. I've noticed lately, and this one I could probably stand to do it like you did. You know, dark, do the dark value in the background first. Because, like I was saying earlier about this is going to feel kind of awkward right now because the background is so light that the dark and the crystal is going to look really out of place. Yes. But I've noticed lately what I do is, you know, I, I get almost complete with my, my subject except for the highlights where I get to a point where I'm like, I don't know, I think that might be about there but I can't really tell and then I'll go put in the background and once I do it that it really makes all the values and everything else pop so I can see oh okay I need to go adjust this or I'm good I can go add my bright pop highlights and be done you know and these little like this is supposed to be a straight line right here mm -hmm. but how it's just broken and there's some paint I like that I like I do too, yeah. That's why I like using this because I have less control. Less control. And that's one of the reasons that I like using, you guys are, you guys are familiar with my puffy old number eight filbert. <laughs> I like using this because I don't have full control over it and I'm actually going to use that in just a few minutes. As soon as I finish up with my values in here, I'm starting to become really super happy with the way this is looking. Still just using my quarter my quarter inch. We've never painted together before. Mm -mm. It's kind of fun. We should do it more often. Yeah, I'm down. I love painting. Me too. It's just time, that stupid time thing. Yep. It's in the way. Pesky jobs. Mm. <laughs> Freaking adult responsibility. <laughs> right now I'm just using the ed the edge of the palette knife to give me a clean edge too. And if you really look, my paint in my palette, it's not even that mixed. I'm being a little bit lazy on purpose just because nice. I want blotches. I like all these thick crusty spots that kind of come out. The variation, and the yeah, marble. I want it to look like a painting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think that a lot of people feel like if their painting isn't, you know, because they get asked a lot, well, how do I make it look more realistic? And I think that realism, although, you know, it takes an incredible amount of skill to do realism, but I think that the goal of realism is assumed people assume that that is the goal if you're gonna paint right your goal is to be a realistic artist to paint to paint real and I think that that takes away so much fun in yeah expression not that you can't be expressive and be realistic but if your focus especially when starting out is on realism and I think you handicap yourself. I don't know, that's the way it seems to me. Right. Don't, don't, don't think you're supposed to do certain things because yeah. that's the way it's always been done. I, know. <laughs> I saw so-and-so do it, so this is the only way. This is the right way. To right. Do it. No, that's, that's his way. That's yep. how he's, or they're comfortable doing stuff. Yep. You find your own. If you if you want to follow their path a little bit and take a little bit of that here and there, yeah. Find multiple teachers. Yeah. And really find what you're comfortable with. Absolutely. Yeah, there's there's a million and one ways to do anything. This is a really fun painting to just kind of zone out with. Yeah, it's really nice and loose. Because, you know, with crystals, they can be anything right. you want. The colors can be anything. You don't have to worry about light source, really, because it's transparent and the light would be bouncing around and shining all over the place. And, and it's your painting, so you don't have to worry about that anyway. But 
This is a very low pressure painting too. It is. It's not like you're like, oh man, this one part's gonna be so tough. I know. It's also abstract. It it's is. All it's just super chunky abstract. Triangles. Just look at them as individual yeah. shapes. Don't worry about how am I gonna make it look transparent. Don't worry about that. Yeah. Putting the the shapes where you see them and you values. know trying to get the the values and the colors is, you know, not as accurate to the image, but you know if. The image is dark right here, and you put the dark right there. That's going to help, you know, say that it's reflecting the wall in the back. That's what I mean. But so when I was when I first saw this image, and I was like, oh, I really want to paint that. I was super intimidated by it because I don't paint a lot of glass type, you know, looking images, and so I was a little bit worried about how I was going to make it look like glass but then or you know crystal clear and then when i started working on it i was like oh this is actually really simple if mm -hmm. you give yourself the time and the patience and you just work the layers and you don't worry about you know that stupid perfection word then it's gonna look awesome and you're gonna love it get it out of your vocabulary yep Perfection is perception. It is, but also you might think it's perfect today and six months from now you look at it and you're like, what was I thinking? Well, I'm actually a little bit of the opposite where <laughs> I look at it and I think there's something missing. I think I could do better, but yeah. I got to let it sit and rest. Yeah, yeah. And then I'll go back to it maybe a year or two later and go... Yeah, that wasn't that bad. You know, I was doing pretty good at the time. I'm just a little too critical of myself. But I'm have you let it stew? But have you ever done the opposite where you're like, "This is incredible," and then you look at it a while later and you're like, "Oh, what was I thinking?" I'm so yeah, embarrassed. Yeah, yeah. When that happened a lot more when I used to drink and paint. Yeah. I'm sober now. Get that good. But, uh, I would have wine or something while I'm painting, and yeah. I think I'm the best freaking artist <laughs> in the world. Yeah. Go back in the morning, go. Yeah, that's not very good. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I don't I don't paint and wine. Yeah. Not to mention it's dangerous. Coffee's better. <laughs> Coffee, I actually tea. can't drink anything while I'm painting because I I did the other day. I just had I think it was just a glass of water. But I glanced at my paint water jar, you know, this nasty looking thing. I glanced at it. <laughs> when I took a drink of water and I was like, oh, that was really unappetizing. Mm. Made me think I was drinking paint water. You haven't drank paint water yet? No, but mm. I'm so afraid I'm going to. Mm. So I'm just glazing some white. See how, because I'm using that matte medium, see how thin it is? So I'm not losing any of those colors underneath, but I'm able to get that bright highlight that I wanted there. So really light pressure, a lot of matte medium, and then just smear it with your finger. Just pick up a little more matte medium if you get a line that's kind of hard. How are you liking that matte medium so far? It's nice. Yeah? Can you tell the difference? That's what I'm trying to see. I think I still have a lot of water in mine, so it needs to dry up a little bit. Mm. So I didn't bother sketching out my my highlight or like the, the light on the table before. I'll just lay that in there now. The what? Just the where the lights oh, on the that, table. That yeah, I didn't I didn't worry about that. And I'm just gonna lay it in really loose. I'm not worried about perspective or you know, making it look like anything in particular. The crystal's what we wanna look at. The light on the table is just kind of a bonus. Throw my shadow. I think that's good. Normally I have a hair dryer next to me too. It helps. Uh, I'm a kind of an impatient person. <laughs> and like a, a paintings do take me a long time just because I do get very little time to actually paint. Yes, yeah, so you I put everything to, into them. So yeah, so I usually like do a layer, hit it with a hair dryer while I'm taking a sip of coffee or something, hit it back, it's dry, next layer. It's yeah. not like oils. This is why I'm such a big fan of acrylics. Yeah, you went through an oil phase for a yeah. while, but you're back on acrylics, huh? It's just the speed of it 
and especially with these great mediums, yeah, it helps it act like oil. Yeah, you can do anything you need to. I'm gonna use my half inch flat for the background, and I just dipped it in a little bit of water. So mostly for this color on the background, I'm gonna do about a 50-50 mixture of my thalo and my burnt sienna, but. I'm gonna mix them until I've got about a chromatic black and then I'm gonna lean it ever so slightly on the thalo side. Oh, actually. This is where I'm gonna throw in just a little bit of Mars Black. And see now if there were areas on my crystal that got away from me or you know if I felt like the shape was weird I can get rid of that here, just with the tip of my brush. So I think it's interesting when you paint, well, you use a lot of color. <laughs> and when you tattoo, what do you do? <laughs> just black and gray. <laughs> and why do you think that is? Um the technique to apply color with tattoos takes a little bit longer it's yeah. a little bit slower and honestly i don't like the way tattoos look over time with color i think they age a little bit nicer with black and gray mm. and i just want my product on skin to last as long as and look as nice as possible for yeah. a long time that's honestly the, the biggest reason. I do enjoy looking at color stuff, but I, I can express myself better in black and gray in a tattoo. I'm more yeah. efficient and more comfortable with it. And over these, you know, 13 years of tattooing, I just don't really have fun doing color. Really? And I, I know that it's kind of been a, an evolution since we met. You used to yeah. do more color. Well, it's because... I have two from you that have yeah. color in them. Well, because uh, the... A lot of clients demand it. They yeah. want color, so you got to do, you know, as far as business goes, you got to do whatever people want. Yeah. But eventually, I feel that my reputation and my work had gotten so efficient in one part of it that I took that gamble yeah. and took away color. It, it is it's scary because it, it could definitely affect my income. Absolutely. But, you know, I was pretty confident in what I can do and, and the type of clients that I have that enjoyed what I do. Right. So it was because of them I was able to do this, to just get really exclusive with black and gray. That's awesome. And tell me the where people can go to see most of your work, like a good sampling. Uh, everything I have, I'm, I'm really active on social media. You can just get on uh, Instagram, will underscore XX, or uh, Facebook, will XX tattoos. Everything is online. It's I'm pretty easy to reach. Okay. Um, sorry, I can't paint a tattoo. In <laughs> Are you holding your breath? Yes. I Don't am. hold your breath. <laughs> Deep breathing. Well, um. No, I hold my breath. I was holding my breath right there too. <laughs> that's kind of how I taught myself to do like really nice clean lines. Yeah. Is the way you shoot a rifle. Oh yeah. You you hold on the exhale. That way your lungs aren't pushing your shoulders up and down. Uh. So as you're exhaling, you pull down as your lungs are deflating, and that's how you get really nice clean lungs. Oh, that makes sense. It's all, it's uh, elbows and shoulders. It's keep your wrist nice and stiff. Yes. And you just pull. That's something that, so my Patreon people and I, we, we get together once to twice a week, and we do live events, and I'll do demos and stuff for nice. them. And that's some, sorry, I'm getting paint all over your table. It's all good. Um, that's something that, we've talked about is you know when you're when you're drawing or when you're making you know straight lines or at least just controlled shapes you know when you sketch with a pencil a lot of times the tendency is to do something like this you know is move the fingers right. or or you know like this but but really it the all the movement you can't see me but all the movement should be from your your shoulders your elbow doesn't even you know bend anymore it's all your shoulder pulling it in mm -hmm. one direction and that's how you get, you know, a straight line that doesn't bow down to one side or the other. Right. See, now that I'm getting that dark color in there, it kind of makes the 
those weird dark areas in the crystal make a little more sense. I feel like the first time I did it, I was like, ooh. And then I did the background, I was like, oh. I know, it's nice when you add a frame or you, you can mm -hmm. you can narrow down the, the specific color or highlights that you want and all of a sudden it all just comes together. Yeah. It's like doubt, doubt, doubt. There yep. Is. Uh, it's that ugly stage. Yeah, you gotta you gotta just wait through it. Every painting has an ugly stage. How how would you feel if because that's kind of a big hurdle in tattooing? Mm-hmm. Oh it yeah, looks, I can't even imagine. It does not look very good, especially about the way I work. Mm -hmm. About eighty percent of the time. Yeah. So you just have to stay confident. You have to know you've done this a bunch of times before, and you know what your process is. Yeah. There is an ugly period, and you just you just got to do what you know you're capable of. Yeah, I know a lot of people will kind of freak out. You know, at the the ugly stage, they're like, oh, everything I, has to be perfect I, from every stroke. Yeah. Exactly. I got to this part and then it looked so bad and I freaked out. I'm like, that, that was the ugly stage. Keep going. Stop pressuring yourself. Exactly. <laughs> so I'm going to change my background just a little bit. I'm not being quite as, you know, daring as maybe I should try to be, but I'm going to change my background a little bit because I feel like in the image it's a little too dark for me. So I'm going to get my dark color and then I'm going to grab a little bit of my unbleached and just because I love that kind of jewel tone blue. I don't know if you can see it. And I'm going to kind of lighten it up in the corner up here as I go. So, you know, when you're painting from a, from a reference image, it doesn't mean that you have to do everything just like the reference image. It doesn't mean that you can't decide to add a point of light somewhere where it's completely black or, you know. Something that I really enjoy about art is uh -huh. the fact that it is my world and I am creating yep. it. I say what's right and wrong and uh, I'm just here to have a good time. Absolutely. Yeah, man, th I mean, there's so many other things that we can stress about. I don't know why we have to, you know, say, oh, I'm gonna go stress out about art today. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna go relax and stress myself out. Exactly. <laughs> no. Just start doing it. And you know, if it looks like junk, because sometimes that happens, happens to me all the time. If that happens, then just start over. Yeah. There's no, there's nothing wrong with starting over. I have a graveyard in my basement. Oh, yes. Of paintings that will never see the light of day. Absolutely. Oh, I would love to dig through that no. graveyard. Oh, yes. <laughs> you know I'm coming over now. It's, it's <laughs> terrible. There's like stuff that's like 80% done in there. And, Dude, I bet uh, that... I bet I would go in there and I'd be like, this is the most incredible thing I've ever seen and I would steal it from you. <laughs> <laughs> but I, uh, one of my goals this year is to p go through that pile, either mm -hmm. re-gesso stuff or re-manipulate it to something new. But I don't want to buy any more canvases until I'm done with this pile. Do you ever do, um, like, I hate to use the word mixed media, because I think that that sounds more, that, that, that sounds, that makes it sound like something I'm not talking about. Um, but do you ever like take paintings that maybe you like one element in it and you hate the rest of it. So you like cut that piece out of the, oh yeah, and then glue it down onto another canvas. Yeah, and, why not? Cool. I would like to see some of that from you. I've never seen you do anything like that. So I'd be interested. I love Try and hold this up so you can see how I lightened that corner just almost kind of randomly I like that so much better so now I'm going to do my shadow of the crystal here I'm going to do the same colors but I'm going to lean it more toward the brown I might not add so much black in it either dancing <laughs> no. right now I'm going fairly thick because I want a lot of coverage I'm, I'm I'm pushing and pulling I went medium then I went dark 
Now I'm going light. I'm going light over the places that are going to be medium later because I'm going to be going over it with a very thin pigment to add color on top of that. Oh, yeah. But the blacks and the whites will still pop through. Yeah, so you're going to glaze yeah. it. Yeah, nice. I'm going to glaze it. That way I'm not having to worry about every single color tone in there. Yeah. And go add a little bit of white for this, and a little bit of yeah. white for this, and a little bit of white for this. Nah, screw all that crap. I'm just going to wash over the whole thing basically putting a filter like a colored filter yeah a black a block of filter over something and everything comes through that's, that's i can't I wait to see with that it, it saves me on time yeah and it's definitely taking a lot of pressure off me so you're just really blocking your values right now that's is all that I'm what doing. you're cool what i'm doing and the warmth i'm you're going to use some of this warmth too i might leave a little bit naked yeah um put a little bit more yellow over here so it gives it that amber tone so are you taking advantage of the tone of the canvas are you yes, le letting much. some of that like look how cool. white this bleach white looks this is uh -huh. even that white so yeah. i'm gonna yeah I might use some of this canvas as the actual tone too. Cool. But when I do use white white yeah. on some of this stuff, it's going to be a really nice pop. Yeah, it's going to really stand out. Yeah. That's pretty good. That shadow's a little strange shaped. I think the shadow on this image kind of looks like a pickle. Pickle rip? <laughs> I'm gonna fuzz it out just a little bit more. It's this the shadow on the crystal part is pretty solid in the image, but I'm gonna make it a little fuzzier. And I'm just gonna wipe my brush off. I don't want it completely clean, but I want to pick up some white. So I want a little bit of that color in there. Or I'm not using whites. So I'm using the unbleached. All this is is just hills and valleys, right? What do you mean? Just highlights, lowlights. Oh, yeah. Just parts that stick up, parts that push down. Yeah. Hills and valleys. Yeah, I think that that's one thing that can be challenging for people, you know, when they're starting out is, you know, we see the world 3D. You know, when you, when you look at something, you're like, so a crystal, let's say, because that's what we're painting. You look at it and you're like, well, I can see to the back. I can see the wall through it. I mm -hmm. can see. And you don't know how to interpret that on a canvas. And you think, how do I make it look like it's three to four inches back there behind, you know, the part that I'm looking at? And that can be challenging. But it's really, it, all you're doing is painting colors. Mm -hmm your brain fills in the rest of the information. Yeah. It understands, you know, so you I just like to put when, the colors where they are. I like when my paintings don't make sense. Like if, if I zoom into any one inch by one inch area, yeah. it doesn't make sense. It's blobs, it's blurs. Yeah. But if you stand a good five to 10 feet away from this thing, yeah. your eyes and your brains just automatically bring the detail out and yep. everything makes sense. Yep. Oh, that's, is that what you were talking about earlier with implied details? Suggested detail, yeah, that's all it is. It's, it's all, you, you got to just relax your eyes, look through the painting. Yeah. And just see blobs. Yep. So a lot of times people will, you know, they stand so close to their painting. And, yeah. Or their, Take a picture of it. Look at it in the small screen. Hold that's your what I always up. tell you guys too. Um, look at it in a mirror. In a mirror, that yeah. That's how big time. I have a, I don't. You have a mirror in here. I have a, a friend who's a really incredible artist. Um, she does oil painting, mostly landscapes. And she has a, a large, a big, huge, like it's a statement piece for a living room type mirror hanging on the opposite side of her studio, directly across from her easel. So while she's mm. painting, she all she has to do is turn her head and look at her painting in nice. the mirror across nice. the room and it helps her you know see everything and you know know where to make adjustments she doesn't have to stop or walk mm -hmm. away from it you just turn her head and look at it through the mirror that's a great idea yeah you've already got the mirror there you should set that up somewhere we do you, you don't paint here very often do you no. you paint at home mostly yeah. i'm a big homebody <laughs> i have no social life <laughs> Are you tattooing today? Not today. Today, I'm painting with you. Yay! Just keep that shadow. 
shadow nice and soft. So I'm doing something here, guys, that I'm always warning you about. Let me see if I can hold it up and show you. So if you do this, can you see right there where I kind of wipe the paint off? Right there with my finger. When that starts to happen, when you wipe the paint off, don't immediately, oh, I gotta fix that, and try and cover it back up because you're just gonna wipe more paint off. So just let it dry. Come back to it later. Or use it. Or use it. Yep. Just let it be there and uh -huh. maybe it'll look kind of cool. It'll be that little character that you didn't plan on, that little bit of exactly. imperfection. You never know what you're going to like. Just let it sit. Until the end. It's like when we did the, the lotus last week. I put that purple in the water, that really deep, dark purple, where I wanted a little bit more pink. And I was like, oh, no, that looks so horrible. I've just ruined this. But I figured since it's already ruined, I might as well just leave it because it can't get any worse if it's already ruined. Mm. And then at the end, I was like, oh, actually, I think that's exactly the color that I wanted. I'm going to write it out. Yeah. So you never know what you're going to end up liking. Trust your instincts. Yep. And save corrections for the end. So are you showing your art anywhere? Uh, no, no, not right now. Mm -hmm. I'm honestly kind of a big hermit. Yeah. And I'm not really interested in, in a lot of things. I just want to paint and have some family time. And yeah. This is actually just pure R&R &R for me. Good. A lot of the paintings that I've been doing lately, I'm honestly doing just for friends and just for fun. Nice. Hey, man, I mean, you got to do it to please yourself. I just threw a tiny bit of titanium white in there. I didn't clean off my brush. Just kind of scrubbing a little bit in there. Something that I find very interesting mm -hmm. with some people in art is that they need to pressure themselves just a little bit, just a little bit to understand how they are capable of achieving a lot more than they think they're capable of achieving. Okay, so example. Doing gesture drawings, you know what I mean? Basically it's just quick ge geometry shapes, like looking at a bottle, a skull, oh, yeah. or whatever. And breaking it down into like the basic shape yeah. that you see. So you start off with five second drawings. Mm -hmm. it sounds ridiculous. That it sounds terrifying. So, so you get little, you get a big one and you break it off into how many blocks you want to do, you go five seconds, five seconds, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, mm -hmm. 30 seconds, one minute, and five minutes at the very end. Mm. Once you start feeling the pressure, mm -hmm. and then you get to that five minutes, it feels forever. I bet. So it just changes your perception of time and what you're able to actually do. So and so you do the same image over and same over. Same thing over and over. All right, I'm going to move to my puffy number eight because I'm going to start getting into the little details. I may still do some glazing of, you know, my shadows and highlights, but this crystal in the image, it's not crystal clear. See what ah. I did there? <laughs> it's got some little, you know, inclusions. That's what I'm going to work on. And you don't have to use a number eight filbert. I want you to use any kind of a brush or a tool that's a little bit puffy and kind of scattered. I'm using this one specifically because it's a yucky old brush. So I'm just going to get a tiny hint of this color just because I'm not using any one of these colors by themselves anytime in this painting. Get my unbleached some matte medium make sure my brush is good and puffy and I'm gonna come in here I hope you can see I know this top down is not the the best camera angle ever I'm just gonna touch see I'm not doing a brush stroke I'm just gonna kind of stipple yeah and then just kind of smear them occasionally if you get too much just smear it I just noticed that this part of my crystal isn't as sharp as it should be mm -hmm. because in the image this part drops lower than this part yeah and this is where a lot of people would be upset right or frustrated or eh. they didn't so do it right. I'm gonna correct 
everything I did, I'm going to undo a lot of this stuff, uh -huh. re-sculpt it, and reshape it to where I'm happy with it. Yeah. And it's not a big deal. No, it's not a big deal. So I'm going to cut. How hard would that be? We already kind of talked about it, but how hard would that be if your background were completely done by now? It, it would definitely make it more difficult. Yeah. Because I would struggle to get the highlights out. Yeah. I just put a little matte medium there so I can kind of smoke that part out. Right there, that's just matte medium. And then I can kind of lightly smear it. Because it's speckly and stipply, but it's also kind of smoky. So to make that look a little bit more natural, one other thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back into my dark color and just kind of tap a bit of that on, see? And I'm gonna do the same thing, kind of bring some of that into the lighter area. So this reminds me of a couple of years ago, well, a few years ago, I had these really ugly countertops in my house. They were like blue. <laughs> like no but not just any blue so you, you know in the 90s how the kitchen decor was really big with like the geese on it the the geese with the blue bows around yes, their necks yes, so that's yes. what color blue my yes, countertops were yes. it was horrible and i decided i was going to paint it and um i wasn't even painting on canvas really at that point yet so i wouldn't said I was any kind of an artist. So see how that just kind of transitioned the dark to the light. I feel like it makes it look a little more natural. So I bought three colors of gray in this countertop paint from the hardware store. And one was a dark gray, one was a mid-tone, one was a light gray, almost white. And I had no idea what I was gonna do with them, but I was gonna have gray countertops. So I painted the entire countertop with the mid-tone, and it was just this flat, boring gray color. I'm gonna just start doing the same thing in here. And this part here is a reflection of this part. So whatever I do here, I'm gonna do here. So it was just this flat gray, and I didn't know what I was gonna do with the other colors. So I took like a grocery sack and dunked it in the dark color and just started like stamping it all over the countertop and it looks so bad it looked so bad <laughs> and i was like oh no i've just destroyed now i have to get new countertops <laughs> we were getting our house ready to sell oh, no. so i was like well, now i have to get new countertops and you know but i had the same attitude i'm like all right well i've already destroyed my countertops i already need new ones so i'm just gonna keep going <laughs> and see what happens yeah why not so i took the lighter color bunched up a grocery sack and did the same thing. Just, I swear this is, this story is going somewhere. It has to do with what I'm doing. <laughs> I started splotching the, the lighter color on top of everything. And it looked just as horrible. It looked so bad. And I was like, what am I going to do? So then I took the mid-tone color that I painted the countertop in the first place mm -hmm. and I splotched it over top of everything else and it looked incredible. Cool. It looked so good. And so my point with that is, you know, you, you might start doing something like this, kind of like how I'm just like stippling this color on here. And you think, now it just looks like polka dots of this color. It doesn't seem to fit in here at all. So take another color that already exists in the space and stipple it over it as well. And, you know, it's the same concept as we always talk about with layers. The more layers you have, the more life things have to them and the mm -hmm. more natural things start to look. So right here where I did that, I had the light color and it looked flat and boring just like it does here. But then I took a bit of that dark color and you know, merge them together, and now it looks much more natural in that place. So that's my countertop story. My Patreon people have heard me rant about the countertop before. <laughs> They're very familiar with my countertop story. It's crazy when you just really kind of stop caring and take the pressure off yourself and go, I wonder where this is going to take me. Yeah. Let's just figure it out. You yep. might figure out a new technique. You might find a new color yes. palette that you enjoy or something you would never try before because you were a little nervous 
Yep. Who cares? It's just canvas. And maybe it's not right for <clears throat> what you're doing right then and there. Keep it in your back pocket. Exactly. You know? It's all arsenal stuff. Yep. But you just learned something new. If you know, if you if you have that mindset, if you didn't throw up your hands and go, Ugh, I just totally ruined it. Yeah. I suck. You know, if you don't do that, then you just learned something that you can take on to you know another project somewhere. But I actually love when things like that happen. You know, yeah. when I'm painting and I'm like, Ugh, well, I've totally ruined it already, so it can't hurt to keep going. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And when you, that's when you start painting with no pressure. Yeah. You're like, oh, it doesn't matter. And that's when I find that really good things happen. So when you actually enjoy painting. Yeah. When you start relieving yourself of the pressure. Yeah. I'm going to zoom you in here really tight because I want to show you, seriously, this is really simple what I'm doing. If you have a teeny tiny little sponge, you could do the same thing. See, it's, it's controlled. I'm not just stamping in all kinds of places. A little matte medium, kind of smear part of it with my finger. That's all I'm doing. And Will did it a totally different way. How did you do the little, the little pokey bits down here? Uh, I've been stippling white over black over white. So it's really the same technique that I was talking about. We're just using different brush strokes. Yeah. Yeah, it's that layering of the colors that pulls everything together. And as far as like color matching, like if we did to take a break, let's say I forgot exactly what mixture, mm -hmm. if they accidentally grabbed a different blue, mm -hmm. sometimes I find that having different tones in it, yeah. even if the valleys are good and the details are still there, but that tone just keeps adding to the richness of yeah. it. Because sometimes people are like, oh wow, why did you pick that color? Like, I just, it happened to be the closest one to me. <laughs> yeah. Like, cause there's nothing, I just kind of went with it. And yep. Sometimes I just like, grabbed the, the wrong color. Yeah, it's just that simple. I've done before where I just have like a, a quick idea that I want to work out. It's not like a painting, just a quick idea. So I'll just grab the closest junk canvas I have to yep. me and just start doing it on that. Not even painting over the old canvas, just start my idea. And a lot of times when I do that, whatever color that junk canvas happened to be, when I go to actually do my painting, that's what color I paint my underpainting. I'm like, I really liked the way that color worked with this. I'm gonna do that. Or have you ever just started, like gotten a painting, it, it's whatever, you, you're gonna practice something, flip it around, doing a different thing, yeah. leave what's there, now it's your new background, and you do this, some new crazy thing over here, and now you have these layers and colors and crazy shapes that you would have never done on purpose. Absolutely. Yeah, man, sometimes planning too much can... Stop thinking in your head. ruin it, yeah. Start thinking on the canvas. Absolutely. I just went back into my dark color. I didn't clean off my brush. I love my gunky number eight. <laughs> and I'm gonna do that exact same thing. So I'm gonna come into here. And I'm just lightly dashing some of that in. And that gives the little shadowy bits in here. And But if it ends up being too intense, then I dash the lighter color over it again and push it down. What are your favorite things to paint? I don't have one. No? I. With tattooing, mm -hmm. I've taught myself it's not the subject matter that you're working on, but it's how you work it yeah. and what you make of it. Because I don't get to choose what I get to do most of the times. I I get to be picky and mm -hmm. say yes or no, but yeah. most of the time it's not my idea, it's not my, my tattoo. Yeah. So I just have to make the best of whatever I get and just have a good time with it. That's good. If people give me freedom, you know, mm -hmm. I'll make the best of that. So I don't have like a favorite subject. Okay. Of course I like creepy dark stuff. Can't be creepy all the time, it'll get stale. Yeah, for sure. But you do like, you do sweet 
really well too. But, but with the you know the little oh, I know what, you mean, what yeah. was it the the pig? There was a pig. Little flying pig. Yeah. No, it was the little pig in a jar or something. Oh yeah 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 yeah. <laughs> it was so sweet, but it was you know. It you know it, it kind of goes. It's not for along. everybody, but I certainly liked it. I'm a Tim Burton type of person, Heck yeah. so I like the cutesy, creepy, yeah, the little girl stuff, the little doll stuff, yeah, toy in there or something. I like doing um, um, old baby carriages. Oh yeah, I love your baby carriage the with Victorian the with the balloon. So creepy. Yeah, yeah, with the red balloon. I did. Um, I I got tattooed by somebody and. We we're talking about the psychology of art and how if you add something cute, something pleasant in the art itself, yeah. it messes with people's heads because they don't know how to feel about it. Yeah. So you get more of an emotion out of them. <laughs> I look at it and I don't know how I feel about it because yeah. I kind of like it, but it is disturbing. Right. But I can't stop looking at it. That's my favorite. When I mix, like people That's can't even awesome. like figure out what's going on in their own heads. Yeah. I like it, but I, I feel I dirty for it. Something's wrong about it. <laughs> I shouldn't like this. And it's the psychology. There's actually a, a geometry. Uh-huh. Um, there is the geometry like of, of people that are handsome or attractive. Yeah. There is an actual geometry to that. Yeah. That's very aesthetic to our eyes. There's also a geometry to make things cute. A yes. baby elephant and a human baby all have the same rough traits. Small yeah. mouth, little nose, big cheeks, big, big eyes. forehead, big eyes. Yep, that which is why we love puppies too. Yes. Yeah. You look at it and the chemicals in your head go, I want to take care of this. It's, yeah. it's adorable. So I like using that geometry with dark images. <laughs> it, awesome. it, it messes with you. And I like that emotion. I've had somebody, I had a, a painting at a, at a restaurant once. Uh -huh. And the bartender told me that this guy who looked like he was intoxicated was staring at my painting for a good 10 minutes. And it was at the top of the stairs. And uh -huh. he was just standing there staring at it. And it was a trans... It looked like a glass flower with a pink bee. I tried to make it very neutral, not, not offensive. Yeah. It's for a restaurant. Yeah. And there was something about this painting that just got this man, uh -huh. where he went up to it, just picked it up off the wall, <gasps> frame it and everything, and threw it down the stairs. What? Yeah. So they call me, and they're like, um, yeah, so you, there was a little incident with your painting, and then he told me about it. I'm like, dude, that is awesome. <laughs> He's like, what? I was like, my painting struck a chord with this human so much that he just felt the need to destroy it. Like, I did something. I got something. And but it was me, destroyed? Awesome. It's just a painting. I can do another one. Will Plus, you? <laughs> what, what I ended up doing was, I mean, it's never really destroyed. So the frame, the, fr the frame was broken in yeah. the end. So I just free framed it. Mm -hmm. I left all the cracks and everything and I painted the cracks black and I just kind of glued it back together. Mm -hmm. And it looked cooler. Okay. It looked like it'd been through a fire. Okay. I like the It's kind of like that Japanese technique yeah, of where the they, bowl. yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. What is that called? I know what that's called. I don't called. know. I don't you know. just got to make lemonade. That's Whatever's true. handed to you. You have a much better attitude make than I do. Lemonade. And right. it's just art. You know, who cares? You can do it again. The art you did it once, you can do it again. Yeah, it's, this isn't the art. The art's in my hands. It's, it's the, the, the action of creating, yeah. not the creation. Because if but I did this by accident one time, true, it is a time, it's like a marker, mm -hmm. but... Um, you can't just can't be attached to these things. I forgot. There's one other one that I wanted to do before I finish up down here. I'm gonna do just a little hint of one in there because it's a nice reflection, but it also just looks kind of flat, and I don't want it to be flat. So just a little of my darker color. What are you doing? What's I'm your? I'm thinking right now. I'm thinking. What are you thinking? You're gonna thinking. do. I'm um, just thinking about the tints and the tones that I want to go through because I'm getting to the point where color is starting to be matter. I love that green. And that's just the same two colors, huh? Yeah, it's uh, turquoise and uh, mm. burnt sienna. It gives it a nice dirty green. And I'm gonna, I want this soft green as a background because mm -hmm. I am going to be using that purple as my pop color. Yeah. So I need all this supporting cast to make that special. Yeah, and green and purple are such nice colors to use together. Halloween colors. Heck yeah. With, with a nice bright orange underpainting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and all these little parts of the orange, I'm actually going to leave that there. Nice. So you get all Good. this like layered stuff yeah. going on. That's like I did in, I can't remember if I did it in the Buddha that I did on my, in the video or in the Buddha painting that I did for myself, but 
I did the underpainting in, I think, Diox Purple and Ultramarine Blue. And, you know, so it was like light your eyeballs on fire bright, the underpainting. And then the actual painting on top was done with uh, cadmium orange, so also super, super bright. And then, you know, like really neutral black and white tones. But I left a lot of that purple as well as the orange showing through it and I wanted it to look like stone but that purple and orange showing through I felt like really gave it a little bit of life that it wouldn't have had just being black and white just my light color I'm gonna dab over that yeah underpaintings are fun man just be creative and there's test not, it not out. a lot of pressure no Nope. Oh yeah, that's looking much closer to what I, to what I wanted. I love that, you know, you can use such a limited color palette and get such a diverse, you know, range of colors. That's one of my favorite parts about it. In school we did an exercise where we went from one, two to three to four to five colors. Mm -hmm. and that's all you were allowed to use. In the beginning it was just black and white, black and white plus one, black and white plus complementary and then triad and mm -hmm. all that stuff. So helps you develop. That way you're not jumping into, you know, a marathon when you barely know how to walk. Yeah, exactly. Steps, steps, steps. A little matte medium and some unbleached. That unbleached is a little dirty with the other colors, and that's perfect. Actually, I think I'm going to dirty it up just a little bit more. All right, let's go a little bit more. I actually want a bit of a darker color, but I want it very, very thin. So I'm going to really make it transparent with the matte medium because I'm going to start doing a little bit of glazing right here at the bottom. I feel like it's just a little too light. So I'm just going to lightly glaze over, but see, that's the fun part of using the matte medium is I'm not going to lose all of those colors and all that texture that I put down already. And at this point, I'm not even looking at my reference image anymore. My painting's gonna end up being different, and that's cool. Because I'm on a roll, and I'm happy with where I am, and that's what counts. I took a class mm -hmm. in uh, Colorado by David Chiefitz. Probably saying that all wrong. Mm -hmm. He's an amazing painter. Mm -hmm. He mostly does a lot of palette work, and I've really, I've never was familiar with palette painting, and then I just thought this was an amazing opportunity to learn from him. Yeah. And we were drawing, we were painting grapes and grapes and grapes. With a palette knife? Hated grapes. <laughs> but it was so crazy that this guy was so efficient. Um, it was a room for about 12 experienced artists. Uh -huh. Like You walk in there, everybody has a cup of coffee, everybody's feeling good. You can feel the confidence in the air. So we get dropped off, and uh, the people that we were with came back after a few hours. They went and just messed around around town. Mm -hmm. They said they came back, and when they entered a room, it felt like a funeral. Oh, no. Everybody got brought down a peg, huh? Yes. <laughs> and I said... That is what it's like to be in a room full of artists who all just got kicked in the junk by <laughs> somebody who is 
really amazing. Right. So there, you're always going to feel that way. There's yeah. always somebody better. Just yep. don't measure yourself off of them. And Absolutely. just be humble enough to go, can you teach me how to do that? Exactly. That's pretty freaking amazing. Exactly. There's nothing wrong with that. And I was like working on these grapes for like two to three hours. So <laughs> sick of it. And I started doing background stuff. Uh -huh. And he would come around my shoulder like, no, 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 dude, get back on those grapes. <laughs> <sighs> so no I get back on the grapes. Yeah, he's like, no, we need to focus because he liked to do. He would, like, he would do this entire crystal mm -hmm. to finish, without doing anything, and then he moves. Like that's his technique. So you're there to learn from him. You do whatever he says. Right. right? So I'm trying his technique. He's like, look, and he sits down and he just smears a little bit of purple white. He blends it on the spot. He gets one, highlights it. He's like, kind of just like that. And, and you're like, like, no, not kind of just like Dude, I hate you so much right now. <laughs> that took you like three minutes to do. It would take me all and day. And it was beautiful <laughs> because his hands were so educated with right. the blend. The oh. muscle memory and the, yeah. But it, it's, it's good to have those experiences. Yeah. Especially when you start getting a little too cocky with yourself. Yeah, Will. <laughs> <laughs> just glazing a little bit of a lighter color here. Just create a little reflective surface also I'm gonna be using this stuff towards the very end this is oh, a yeah, black 2.0 and it's a uh, it's a reformulated like that really really matte black that doesn't allow any light I think I'm gonna throw a little bit in this background here I've actually never used this before but I think it'll make this crystal really pop if we throw a little bit of that I may I know you're a big fan of the matte medium stuff, but if mm -hmm. you put a little bit of gloss oh, yeah. on the crystal itself, that, would really, oh, that would really the, make it pop. Yeah. So having super dull around here uh -huh. with a really nice gloss, I think will really push that forward. Heck yeah. So this is, this is dark, but it's not black. Right. Yeah. And you'll be able to, even if we just put Mars black over that, you'd, you'd see, see how difference. dead that is yeah. compared to what you've got going on there. Mars is a little bit more warmer than this too. Yeah. So you easily tell the difference in that. All right. All I'm going to do now is just go through with white. I might use a little unbleached here and there and a little matte medium, but I'm really kind of focusing on white and just kind of punching some bright points. You know, you got to get you got to get some nice bright highlights in there to make everything really stand out. I think that the the more experienced I get with painting, the more I realize that the difference between a you know, a professional looking painting and an amateur looking painting can sometimes just be how daring you were with your values. You know, if you're if you're willing to take your values take your black to you know your dark values to black and if you're willing to take your light yeah. values to white and have them right there next to each other that that can create a lot of drama that makes it look really professional and so i think that's why lately we've been doing a lot of paintings with you know dramatic lighting is that something that i'm really trying to focus on is you know pushing myself to to really be brave with my values so this right here is a really watered down um raw sienna mm -hmm. and i'm going to go over the blacks and the white part of it too to kind of show what i was talking about before mm -hmm. where the highlights still stick through and mm -hmm. i'm just tinting it so I don't have to have all that pressure to make this specific tone of value. Right. You just paint right over everything, even if right in the black and the white area. Yeah. The highlights are still there. Well, and sometimes glazing like that is exactly what you want because mixing so, white with the raw sienna completely changes yes, it. You get this or the burnt sienna. Creamy orange. Yeah, it becomes a completely different color. Whereas if you layer it, it keeps its true color. Mm -hmm. And you can make it brighter. Mm -hmm. um, something that I've been doing a lot before, it sounds a little weird, but I use silver paint. Mm -hmm. It's really, it's a thin transparent silver, but if you do that as, mix it with your undercoat and stuff, whenever you put a tint on top of it, it does make it glow. It has that reflection from the inside out. That little bit of sparkle. It makes it pop. Interesting. What kind of, what kind of um, metallic paint do you like? I've never found a metallic 
paint that I really care for. This one, um, it's called Trans. Oh, it's the Utrecht silver. one. Yeah. Oh, okay. So this, it does say heavy body, but I uh, sometimes I use this mm -hmm. to um, thin out other paints. Really? Instead of matte or instead of any medium or uh -huh. water, I'll use this because it just makes it a little bit clearer, a little more transparent. Interesting. Well, you still have that, that. And it adds a little bit of interesting life to yeah. it. So when you're seeing it in person and you move around a little bit, you can actually see the iridescence, a little bit of a pearly feel. Yeah. So if you only add the silver to your main subject uh -huh. and then leave everything else kind of dull, it makes that one main subject more, get more attention. How interesting. I might have to take some of these techniques and try them out. Try it out. I'm going to put just a tiny hint of white up on here. I don't want it to compete. I feel like I want to keep this one the brightest. Maybe I'll put a little bit more of the unbleached in that one instead. That's a great color. The unbleached? Yeah. It's so good, isn't it? I'm definitely grabbing some of that. Yeah, I love it. It's one of those colors that I don't use it, you know, all the time, but it's one of my essentials. I can't live without unbleached. I've really been narrowing down my palette to be simple and efficient. Mm -hmm. Gets me where I want to be quickly. Yeah. Too many choices. I, I have a problem if I have too many choices. <laughs> got to keep it simple for myself. Yep. If you only have a couple, then obviously you know what you're choosing. Right. But I, I used to have a super simple palette. It was, you know, two of the primaries, like one brown, black and white. And I've expanded it a little bit since then, but it's still fairly simple. Um, I've kind of expanded the, like blue. I, I buy a lot more blue than really any other color because you know you can do so much with blue. Mm -hmm. And I don't buy green paint, so having a wide variety of blue you know, means that I can have any color of green that I want. I don't buy, let's see, I don't buy a lot of brown. I have like burnt umber and burnt sienna. And then for the most part I, I like to mix my own. But yeah, I'm a mixer. I um, love color mixing. Right. Uh, purple and uh, phthalo green. Yes. I really like that one because you mix, you get a really Navy nice blue. blue. We just did that on my so Instagram it's, recently. It's I just showed mix. everybody that. Yep. Diox purple and phthalo green. Especially if you want to do moody stuff. Yep. There's certain palettes that have already been established that'll get you mood. Like red, green, and purple with black. Mm -hmm. It's Halloween. Yeah. I use that one quite a bit. Yeah. Just because I want that feel. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of, you know, really great colors on the market. But and if you learn how to mix... You can have any color. I mean, even just yeah. even just owning a limited palette of colors, you can have more colors in your possession than if you bought every single tube of paint that they it made. It's expensive. It is really expensive. And I've bought colors before because I'm like, oh, I love that color. Mm. And then it ends up sitting and I never use it. And yeah. So... Like there's a color that I'm looking at right now. I've been, I've been wooed by this color for quite a while, but I've resisted buying it. And it's a uh, green gold. Mm -hmm. Such a gorgeous color, but yeah, it's green. Gold. I'm not gonna use it. What? Well, I paint with a lot of green, but I just mix my own. Oh yeah. And I mix it as I go so that I get a lot of variations in the green. You know, if you're painting a landscape, you're not really gonna have, like. You know, this green hillside that's all this one color of green. Right. There's going to be little variations to it. And so it's just easier for me to mix my own and control that. 
The only green I really buy is thalo green, but that's because it's so good for mixing. It's a really good primary. Yeah, it is, man. Mix that color with red. Any red, you've just got the the darkest. Your blue, the thalo blues and the thalo greens. Mm -hmm. you gotta have that in your mix. Yep. So strong. Yep. Strong like blue. <laughs> But to use thalo green by itself, uh -uh. Uh -uh. nope. But some people do, and it looks incredible. Right, right, right. I'm not, afraid that's of all it. Just though. taste. It is. It it's is. It's just preference and taste. Yeah, but it scares me when <laughs> when I see it on my canvas in its solid form. I'm like, oh, that's so green. I am not a fan of orange. Really? Just in general. Love it. But burnt sienna is forever in my palette. That's so funny because cad orange, I use cad orange so much. I'm so in love with it. It's, it's almost like, you know, like emergency cone orange. Right, right. <laughs> and I love it. But it's such a great color for mixing too. Like you mix it with deep violet or, oh, it's ultramarine. You get the most gorgeous, like, copper, rusty-type copper color yeah, when you yeah. mix it with ultramarine. It's funny you mention that. Um, my, like, palette that I've been using lately, the reason I use a lot of uh, Burnt Sierra and Turquoise mm -hmm. white and black is um, I have these printouts of copper plates that have been painted yes. on my wall, and that's been my color palette for the last two months. Yes. I rusted love metal. patina copper. Yeah, rusted metal is the best. Yep. I do kind of feel bad because I'm not giving you guys full instruction like we usually do. But I hope you're still getting something out of this, you know, just kind of the conversation and um, seeing that I'm not making up this stuff as I <laughs> when I tell you not to not to worry about things or that there's no rules. You know. Just guides. This bro is telling it like it is too. But I'm just kind of going through it now with some lighter color and just dashing on little bits where I feel like I need to kind of set it apart from another section a little bit more. I've been painting all in one sitting for a while. I might have to take a break. I don't usually paint this long without stopping. I usually get stuck. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of times, like, like, a long time for me to paint in one sitting is usually like an hour. And then I just have to, like, take a breather, even if it's just like five minutes. Get I just have back. to walk away. I got a lot of back problems from tattooing. No, I just have to reset. Just gotta reset my brain. That doorbell reminds me of a game show. <laughs> it sounds like a game show.
feel like there's something going on up here that I don't like. And I can't tell what. So I'm just going to play with the glaze and the layers. So what are you doing over there? I am adding that artsy feel. Real choppy, real thick. Mm, mm -hmm. I like when the edges become done a little bit. Mm -hmm. This is where it gets a little scary because you do end up going over stuff that you've carefully laid out. But that's, I don't know. So what's your attitude on that? Whatever happens, happens, yeah. or I can bring it back? Both. Both. Cool. I am confident that I can fix it if I want to, but that's not the point. Yeah. I want to lose control. Yeah. I'm trying to give up control. Well, finding out what happens, you know, organically is sometimes, it can be really exciting, yeah. you know. Because when you, when you do what you know how to do when you control it then all you're going to get is predictable results right and it's but, boring and clean yeah but if you just kind of say well we'll just see what happens you know you're able to do things that you didn't know that you could do because mm -hmm. <laughs> you never would have gone for that you didn't know that you could do it i think it's safe yeah it's boring it is. Especially when it comes to art. It like, is. What, is what, what are you really risking? Exactly. A little bit of criticism, who cares? Exactly. The person who criticizes you, just don't ever show them again. Mm. They don't matter. Tell them. Exactly. Let's see. I think I'm going to try and darken, actually, this one little edge. I know in the image, these little bits up here at the top... They're all really kind of... Are you making fun of my bits? No. Oh, because I say bits all the time. Bits. Little bits. You can't really tell where one starts and the other one stops. They all kind of merge together, but I don't really care for that so much in my image. I want to see them be just a little bit more distinct. Not a ton, but... Yeah, I'm getting water all over everything. You are so messy. I'm like a child over here. You are like a child. I'm just missing like a bowl of cereal. <laughs> a Cheerio stuck Cheerio to your cheek. Cheerio something. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let's get regular white. Again, still just, I did not clean off my brush very well. So it's still kind of that dirty color, which is good. Is that your glazing medium? That is the gloss. The gloss, yeah. Version of the matte that you use. Yeah. So same thing. Yeah. Look like I was saying, I think I want my crystal a little bit shiny. Yeah, I think that the contrast there will be really cool. I'm gonna go just right over everything we've done already. Is it all dry? What if it blends? Then it blends. Cool. <laughs> I love that attitude. Is that just because you don't have a hair dryer today? Yes. Nice. Honestly, I would have, but then... Well, maybe now you'll be like, oh, right? I actually like it. Right. And you'll quit using a hair dryer. Or, you know, you'll, maybe. you won't use it during certain times. I think this part's a little dark for me. That purple and that orange together. It's popping, huh? Yeah. They really set each other off. And then that green that you got from the blue and the orange is almost along the lines of that phthalo green, which is really nice contrast, too. That's a muddy. I like muted tones, I like mm -hmm. muted colors. I do too. And sometimes I feel bad about that. I'm like, 
Should I like brighter colors more? Mm. <laughs> like even comparing our side by side, not, you know, not comparing, but you know, my colors are so much more muted than yours are. And I, I think sometimes oh, maybe I should be bolder and do bright, but then I look at mine, I'm like, I really love those muted grayed out. I love the subtleness of it. Mm -hmm. And it is challenging. It's a challenge for me to try and, you know, get colors like that and that are obviously different, but subtly different at the same time. So I really like that. Mostly brown. So now you're going to have to start a YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> I can already hear people. Uh, where's his channel? Occasionally, I'll like just do like a little pop-up video uh -huh. on Instagram on one of my uh, pages. Uh huh. But it won't be up for very long. It's just that people are interested, kind of watch me paint. Normally, my normal process is uh, I would get it up to this point. I'd probably stop. Mm -hmm. And then um, maybe relax for a little bit, walk away, mm -hmm. not look about it, not think about it, come back later with fresh eyes mm -hmm. and kind of reassess what I'm doing, redo some highlights, re-sculpt some stuff. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of back and forth. Yep. I do that a lot too. Even when I'm recording, even if I don't say so in the video. <laughs> a lot of times, you know, even if it's a shorter video, it took me a while to film it because I don't typically sit, you know, for very long. Like this is, this is a marathon painting session for is it? me. <laughs> yeah. I usually, it might even be the next day for me by now, regularly. I'm one little spot I'm gonna touch up and then I'm gonna 
finish up and we'll watch Will finish his. I'm right behind you. Are you? You don't have to hurry. So tell me about signing your painting. Hmm? Do you sign your paintings? I do. Why? That's, that's, uh, it's like the reward. You get to claim it at the end. Where do you sign it? Always on the back so you don't ruin the no, image? Right in the front. Right in the front. It's kind of like those Japanese masters that would put their, their little scroll right where it's obvious because you know, you're claiming your work. It's, it's what I did. I'm proud of it. It's yeah. I want everybody to know it. Good. That's another thing that I preached people about. Mm -hmm. Sign it. Put it on the front. Don't yeah. hide it on the back. I'll hide, I'll put messages uh, in the back for the person. Really? Like if I was, if I was looking for somebody, I'll put a little message back there that only they'll know about. Oh, that's kind of fun. I like doing things that only the person that owns the painting Yeah. Owns. Yeah, for right. sure. So there's mine. So I'm going to scoot out of the way and let Will finish up. You did the glow in the purple too, with the light coming through it onto the table. Yeah. And I really like that you use the the different thicknesses of paint. That's one thing I don't do. You know, you've got like your your thin layers, and then you've got your super thick, heavy layers. Chunky stuff. Yeah, I don't do a lot of that. I watched this video a while ago, and it said how does this guy was describing how to sell your paintings, mm -hmm. and he was saying something that's really important to people, buyers is they don't want it to look like a print. They don't want it to be perfectly flat and smooth. Mm -hmm. They want to see all the chunkiness. Yeah. So be really you know, generous with your pigment. Not that that's super important or anything, but it just kind of goes back to making your painting look like a painting. Mm-hmm. These brush strokes are so awesome. I agree. I like brush strokes.
And there are our paintings. So completely different. I really gotta get me some of that matte black paint. That it's was pretty, pretty cool it's stuff. Pretty nasty stuff. I like how flat it is. Yeah, it's super but flat. You can kind of see the reflections right next to the crystal. It's just yeah. dead. It's great. I <laughs> love that. <laughs> and it smells good. It smells like cherries. There's a link also in the video description below to where you can get that. The black is black. Yeah. It's pretty awesome stuff. I'm gonna have to get you some of that. How did you like our co-painting? This was a lot of fun. I really yes. dug it. Um, normally take a little bit longer to paint, so it was nice to just do it in one shot, nice and quick. Yeah. It's nice. It's well, Alprima work. For yeah, it's a nice Alprima. <laughs> it helps you train your mind in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. Think about art a little bit different, which is you know something I'm always telling these guys to do. Is to do something that kind of shakes up your routine a little bit. You never know when you're going to learn something. you got to make yourself uncomfortable yes. in order to progress. Yes. You'll, you'll, you'll get in a rut. Yes, and ruts aren't good for creativity. No, not at all. So where do you want people to go to, to see you in your work? You can find me online on Instagram and Facebook. It's Will underscore XX or Facebook. It's uh, Will XX Tattoos or WillXX.com. Uh, right there, you can contact me pretty easily. You can DM me, PM me, whatever. And uh, yeah, hit me up with any questions about tattooing or even painting. If you're curious about what we did, if you want to know more information on that, I can send you some links on the tools that we used. Or if you have any questions for me personally, I'll be happy to answer. And if you're in Salt Lake and you need a tattoo, that too. I do tattooing uh, part time. Amazing <laughs> part time. <laughs> he does no. amazing work. He's in fact, you've done most of mine at this point. Right. <laughs> Awesome. Including all the ones that you guys ask questions about. <laughs> Hit me up. Let me know. Awesome. Well, thanks for watching and for painting along with us, everyone. And we maybe will see you next time.